Okay, let's go ahead and move on to this uh, next part of Ukraine. Let's put this up there on the screen. This is in terms of the U.S. response. So YouTube is coming under fire here for blocking the Russian parliament channel. Now, the reason that this matters is that they have blocked Duma TV, kind of like a C-SPAN, if you will, for how we would think about it. But Duma TV is drawing a pretty angry response because they said that the restrictions on that are an interference, obviously, by Google and by, uh, by a broader U.S. company into internal Russian affairs. Now, the reason I think that this matters, Crystal, is because they are basically setting the stage for casting it as a U.S. company, which is taking action against the Russian government. It could give them a pretext for, like, a total ban. It puts them in an interesting situation. But... It also just always invites the question of what is the true use of this policy? Right. For example, if there was a video of a Russian member of the Duma, he's since died. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name. Mm. Died from COVID. But a couple of months ago, he was on the floor telling us the entire uh, plan for invading Ukraine. This was like November, something like that. And he's like, we're going to invade Kiev. We're going to take over the city. No matter, he was an ultra-nationalist politician. And he laid everything out for us. And it was only after the invasion that everybody went back and found that video. And they're like, oh my gosh, this guy was just telling us exactly what it is. I, it's just in general, what, I mean, if anybody was watching the Duma TV, were they really going to be propagandized? Or was it more for news and research purposes, right. like ours? Like, how are we supposed to find— How many people find? are being radicalized sitting right. there watching Duma TV? Right. How many people— uh, It's like, for example, C-SPAN is an apt example. How many people actually watch C-SPAN? Even C -SPAN? watched it. Yeah, how many, watch, how many people are watching C-SPAN? In general, it's better to have this type of archival footage so that you can go back and yes, use it for research absolutely. purposes. Absolutely. Or if they're saying crazy stuff, if they're like, hey, we should nuke America, I personally would like— like to know that and have video of it so I can watch it for myself and not have to worry about some Russian TV channel, you know, taking it, splicing it up, cutting it up, and then waiting for somebody in order to put it out there. The raw video is always the best. Uh, I, it, I mean, there is no way to justify this policy. Yeah, it's, it is pure insanity. And it also really gives a lot of credence to the idea that these tech companies basically follow whatever U.S. foreign policy is. Well, they, they blame the government. They're like, hey, we're just acting in compliance with sanctions. And I'm like, maybe. I mean, it's possible. Right. Right. But, you know, I mean, if you think about, like, all of the, the baddie countries around the world, I mean, plenty of countries that are out there committing also horrific atrocities and human rights abuses, and yet they just follow along with whatever the sort of, like, Washington foreign policy establishment ultimately wants them to do. It's effectively, I mean, this is another sort of, like, trying to get on the right side of polite society virtue signal kind of a thing. I can't imagine that anyone really thinks that having Duma TV on YouTube was some, like, right. grand threat to, to the world order or, you know, or really, like, directly harming Ukrainians even. Because, as you said, probably the only people who were really consuming this were people who were using it to understand, like, what are the debates that are going on in this legislative body to try to translate it to the world. It's very important to understand what your enemies are thinking and what they're saying in their own terms. So this is not in the service of any, literally anyone. And it just seems, frankly, it just seems really silly. It also reminds me, you know, of the moves to like take Trump off of Twitter and all those things. That didn't end up diminishing his power. If anything, powerful. it really, I mean, you've <laughs> yeah. made this point a number yeah. of times. It probably helped him because oh, dramatically. people yeah. forgot about how freaking crazy this yeah. guy was on a day-to-day -day basis and how obnoxious and his worst, he, now he has to like put out his statement. So at least there has to be a little bit of thought that right. goes into it as he's drafting it and going through the iterations. With Twitter, you had this direct access to the worst parts of his brain. And so taking him off of that, yeah, again, that really didn't, ultimately help anyone. It's important to know what even the worst, most nefarious world leaders and governing bodies are doing and thinking. So oh, I just think this is completely unjustifiable. Same thing is now happening to us. Uh, I got an update from our uh, podcast host. Let's put this up there on the screen. I'll read you this email. It says, hi, Sagar. Spotify has continued to believe it's critically important to try and keep our service operational in Russia to provide trusted, independent news and information in the region. Unfortunately, recently enacted legislation further restricting access to 
information, eliminating free expression, and criminalizing certain types of news puts the safety of Spotify employees and possibly even our listeners at risk. After carefully considering our options in the current circumstances, we have come to the difficult decision to fully suspend our service in Russia. As a result, we'll be suspending delivery of podcasts and podcast ad content in Russia. Starting on April 11th, Megaphone will no longer deliver podcast downloads to IP addresses that have identified as being within Russia. The impact for you should be minimal. There are currently very few downloads being attributed to Russian IP addresses. <laughs> this is, by the way, a little peek behind the curtain, just so people know that uh, we're not some Russian plant getting a bunch of Russian downloads. <laughs> Here it is from our podcast service itself saying that's not true. However, this is a problem because, look, and Spotify, to be clear, they said they tried to do their best. I don't know what the actual truth is. It does seem to me that this is probably as a result of both the Russian fake news law and our uh, own sanctions that make it incredibly difficult. Yeah. But here's a good example. We had Igor Kotkin on, a dissident to the Putin regime. Would that not be better off being broadcast in Russia? Of it would be, and, yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be, it, it, absolutely. And so now both their government, our government, and all this are making it more difficult in order for people to get a view of the situation. I also think maybe it would be important uh, because there's a lot of bloodthirsty neocons in our media. I think our show would be a useful corollary to the Russian population to say, hey, there's some people in America who condemn Putin, who are not out to get you, and who, who have an audience and who are saying consistently, you know, Putin is the person who to blame in this situation. You are not. We're reasonable folks. We don't hate you. Yeah. We don't want to nuke you. We don't want to bomb you. I mean, I personally— We're not I would, trying to destroy you. We're not trying yeah. to destroy you. We want to live in peace, and, you know, that's not— it's not always going to be fun, and there will be some disagreement, but at the end of the day, this isn't some existential civilizational battle the way that Putin and them paint it, which is definitely the actual point of view that you'll see on the Sunday shows or like that in America. So overall, I'm saddened by the situation, even though apparently we didn't get many downloads. Um, in Russia, just in general, it's better to have the exchange of information, of uh, points of view. This was the original point and uh, promise of the internet in the 1990s, is that it would flatten culture and make it to foster better understanding. Obviously, didn't work out that way. Yeah, yeah. indeed. No, it does feel it does feel kind of sad. It's sad. No, it's yeah. going to be harder for Yegor to yes, watch this yes. from, <laughs> from yeah, Russia, literally. but What's he's going to be do? able to figure it out. Yeah. Hey guys, we're going to be totally upfront with you. This is the most perilous time that we have ever operated in. It is so difficult just to try to sort through the news, but even more importantly, to bring you accurate information as this wave of lockdown and censorship spreads across the nation. Yeah, look, if you can become a premium subscriber today at breakingpoints.com, you're going to help us build out a vibrant, independent media ecosystem, which is free of mainstream pressure. We can't tell you how important that is at a time like this. Yep, that's right. Go to breakingpoints.com to subscribe. We love you guys and we appreciate you so much.